Let's um, get with the third lecture by uh, Ferdinand, which I um, think also will also include friction. Absolutely. Oh, yeah, please. Yeah, so thank you for being again here. Today I have three topics, actually. So one is our heat heat detection, a different way to characterize a running processor. And the idea was um, seen by um, Nitzin from Hebrew University. We implemented this. The second is for quantum fabrication dissipation. So, really, to check how uh, a system where you apply work, short vibrations, and how this is modified in terms of the coherent or incoherent protocol. And the third is coordination enabled work extraction. That's an idea. Yeah. Came about in collaboration with Dr. Wood, and we implemented on, on a pair of ions. So, what we always use is this pair of ions, or in this case, even, even a single ion only, and use now only the speed degrees of freedom. So, it's no longer the bosons are no longer important physics, they are just used for the gate. Okay? And we forget about them, we have just spins which are effective for the gates. And uh, so then it looks like this quantum circuits, which are familiar to many of you. So you have this time going to the right hand side, and the qubits here, in this case, three qubits, one qubit, two qubits. The gates are just these blocks here, either single bit gates or two bit gates, yeah, which you can apply on measurements, in sequence measurements, doing something then depending on the outcome. So that is what a quantum computer can do. And we now use this ability of one computer and tailor it a little bit further such that we can do some quantum thermodynamic experiments. Let me remind you quickly what we do with one computer. We have a segmented ion trap, and the architecture which we have now has six qubits maximum. So sorry for this, but it's good enough for a lot of things. I show you at the very end something which goes to 50 or eventually 100 qubits. So why has it only six qubits in total? Uh, but we can also play with less qubits, but not more than six, okay? We have one laser injection zone where we either have a pair of ions or a single ion. If we have a single ion, we can do rotations on the block sphere, whatever we like. If we have a pair, we can either do independent single bit operations, or we can do a qubit interaction via a gate. So that is what happens in the laser interaction, so the two qubits only. But how do we now put a third one? Well, we have the shuttling architecture with a lot of segments. We can tailor the potential, the electric potentials to move ions from one to the other place, or to bring together two ions, or to separate two ions, or to rotate to flip the order. So these are the things which we can do. And afterwards, we are sorting the ions and we are shuttling then the right pair of ions into the laser interaction to do the interaction and continue. Now, this architecture is scalable, yes, but you need a lot of shuttling because you can operate only on two qubits and all the other ones are lazy. They are sitting around. And you shuttle always the right ones in place, and that takes a lot of time. You cannot operate parallel on all of them. You can only operate on one or two, and you have the rest hanging around and doing nothing. And on top of it, you need a lot of shuttling to bring the right ones into the place. Because say you want to bring this one, you have to take this out two out of the space or bring them over to the side. So we ended with a six qubit algorithm. 90% of the time shuttling things around, 10% with the gates. Continuum is doing this with a little bit more qubits, and they are now at a level of 99% of the time is spent by shuttling, and 1% is spent by doing the gates. So that is not really the good way to go, and I show you the escape way at the very end. But let's stick to this architecture, which is this quantum CCD architecture, and here we do this Raman operations to do the gates and flip the spin, and we read out either bright or dark from the process. Okay, that's the 
core or quantum processor and now sorry display and there are these operations there's this rotation for a single qubit just on block speed we can do a pi over two pulse or whatever we can do a ZZ gate, yeah, depending on the spin of one, you do a rotation or not, yeah, that is entangling two eyes, and that's this uh, type of circuit. And then we can measure, we can measure either at the end, but we can measure also in the sequence, and very important, we don't destroy the yields or entanglement of the other ones because we shine them out of the way and we measure only the ones which are in the laser interaction zone. So that is a single qubit measurement in the Z basis typically, but we can rotate the basis before and measure any axis of the qubit. Something new is the thermal state preparation where you do optical pumping to get really everybody to the spin down that we have perfectly cold temperature, so NMR temperature, or we do imperfect optical pumping and then you get a mixture with equal mixture of both spin states we can attribute the temperature to this. So now we're coming to the first part of my talk and what to motivate this. There are two ways to check a motor. Either you disassemble everything and check every wheel and look what's wrong or what's not wrong, whether it's used up or not. Or the other way is you put the whole machine on, on this kind of uh, instrumentation, you check what is the exhaust, you check how much power can you achieve with the wheels. Maybe you will look what is the consumption of fuel. So you look just to this uh, uh, kind of external parameters. It's much easier to do this one as compared to this. Uh, and what quantum computers typically do, they do this one, okay? We look into every single gate. We do this so-called gate tomography. We do uh, a lot of gate calibrations, randomized benchmarking for all of these processes which have. And if you're going to large machines at the end, it will be just no longer feasible. You have either to trust these things are working, but there are several reasons why it doesn't work because the gate tomography is not, not scalable because you have too many uh, degrees of freedom and, and spin orientation to check whether it's not ending. So you have to trust that the whole thing is working somehow by measuring only some parts. But could you also now implement the other way of measuring how the motor is working? And that's exactly the idea of RAM to think of this global, uh, well, rather a, a more global approach to characterizing quantum computers. And uh, so we have to discriminate now between different high resolution. Of course, this would be ideal. Everything's isolated, but we know that's not the case. We have at least a noisy driving system, okay, noisy input field, which drives our qubits, say the voltage which we use or the laser intensity or frequency, all this is noisy. But on top of that, and this could be spin echoed somehow away if you are very clever, but then you can have also a kind of an unknown qubit, say just an atom sitting somewhere on the surface and that is contact in the other qubits and then it is measured and he could use and that is a, 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 a heat exchange, we call it heat exchange with our qubit systems. And it is of course interesting now to see whether we can find a scalable and also very sensitive uh, method, which is also agnostic of the quantum computer itself. And of course, you cannot observe this qubit because you have no control of it. You can only observe these qubits, which are belonging to your quantum computer. And from the information of these qubits only, you have to tell whether it, there was a coupling or not. So that's the idea in a nutshell. And it looks like this. You have your qubits, you have your wheels that are the gates, and then you have the output. And now suppose we have a heat leak to another unknown qubit here, then the functioning of the computer will be changed and you want to detect this heat leak without measuring here that there is a heat leak, but just looking to these qubits which are under your control. So that's the setting, that's the general rules you have. And now go to passivity. And that would be much better explained by somebody else, I guess. And, and maybe you are going to talk about this, that would be just beautiful, okay? 
Um, so I'm just uh, giving my simple-minded experimental picture. So if you want to have some detailed view on passivity or passivity information, please address the experts. Like Han, for you. Yeah? And uh, so a passivity thing is, this is passivity. This is passive. You have sorted eigenstates and the probability of eigenstates is decreasing. So the highest one has the lowest probability and the other way around. And a typical example, which was mentioned, is the Gibbs state where you have this. This is a kind of the archive, right? Which is passive things. But there are also states when they are looking like this is not passive, okay? And here again from the paper of Ra, this is a passive state. And here you see, oh, this is populated much more, even though it is higher in energy. Well, this is not passive, okay? And uh, so this is also a transformation, which is not uh, not a passive, a non-passive transformation, so to say. But you can, what you can do, you can just change these levels, and you still have a passive state here and there. Okay, so this would be a kind of a passive deformation allowed for the passive way. Yeah? So yeah, well. Now we need a little bit of input. How do we make now the algorithm work? We prepare the state. So that means we have to do this incoherent pumping of spins such that we can attribute the spin temperature to each of the qubits. Then we run the gate sequence and then we look whether this evolution is non-unitary. And you can only detect the output of the of the measured qubits and not the one which is the leak. So here in this work by Ram and uh, uh, on the on the IBM quantum computer, they had this qubit was the environment qubit and these were the system qubits. Okay, and only on this system qubits you could do the measurements, but on this environment qubits you didn't measure any. Not allowed. Okay, you in reality, of course, this is a is a game you know? It is not that you measure a real environment, you have just taken one qubit as a role of environment, okay? And then you are taking these values of the passivity and they are coming from the temperature and these energies of the states which are attributed and you get some inequalities, okay? And now the beauty of this framework that has been formed by Ram and you can read our uh, details here in these two papers, is that you have sharper tests as compared to the second law. Oh, why don't, don't they appear? Okay. So the Clausius inequality, the second law of inequality, gives you some test, but the global passivity test, where you are uh, uh, having a parameter L, alpha, is sharper. We find this is a sharper test. And the passivity deformation test is an even sharper test. And I illustrate this now on the examples. Why doesn't it work? Yeah. On this circuits, okay, we have three qubits, a cold, a hot, and an environment qubit. And at the beginning, we give them different temperatures. While we start from zero, we give them some temperatures. And then we're doing a simple quantum algorithm for them. Well, the quantum algorithm is not it is, looks very simple, but it is not exactly simple because uh, this is not a ZZ gate, it is a 3 over 4 ZZ gate. It's a parametric gate. And so we need to do something. So a, a typical quantum computer wouldn't do this, okay? And we, we had a hard time to implement this first because we were not trained in this type of special gate. And then you, you couple or you don't couple to this environment, and then you measure only the output qubits here. Or the passivity deformation test, it looks quite the same, okay? But it is a different test. And you make some hot code in the environment qubit, and then you run the thing. So how does it really work in the experiment? You have all the segments of the eye trap. Here is the laser detection zone where you do the gates, okay? So you start out with two qubits here, the hot and the cold sitting already in the right place to start with, but the environment is waiting and not covered. 
Now you do the scales here, okay? But then you're coming to the point when you want to couple to the environment, okay? And then you have to bring the environment into the laser injection to do something and bring it on. So that's how it works. Yeah, this is just the pumping, the preparation. That's this preparation zone. Okay, now we are done with this part. You see how much shutting is necessary for the whole business. Now this gate is done. This gate and this gate. You see, here we merge this red and blue. This is the cold and hot. And we do the gate. That's exactly this moment here. And then we separate it again. Okay, we separate them. But now we need the hot together with the environment. You see the hot, the red, and the green go together in this laser interaction zone. Now we do the swap here, and then we separate them again. So you see a lot of shutting is done. Yes? So the temperatures of the qubit, they are physically a different temperature. So Say it again, I do not The temperatures of the qubits, the hot and cold qubits. Yeah. Are they physically different, or are they sampled from? They are, they are, uh, well, it is a, it is a spin temperature. Stuff. So, in, as, as as you mentioned yesterday, you know, they are not perfect in the ground state of vibration, but they are cold as as physical ions. Okay, so they cool almost to the ground state of vibration. And now the temperature is just how much population is the ground state, how much is the other state. So we're talking about the z axis of the drop sphere, no coherence, and that is achieved by optical pumping or impact optical pumping. So this one, the cold one, would be really perfectly cooled in this spin. So that means the optical pump almost perfectly in the ground state. And this one, however, is in a rather warm temperature. That means there is a, a spin balance or more balanced up and down spin states. So that is what now ensemble. Well, we do this. Pumping and then, of course, we repeat the sequence about 8,000 times. Okay. And if you would now prepare a, a, a state which has a certain probability to be spin up or spin down, you measure, yeah, you get a, a certain outcome. You get either spin up or spin down, of course. <laughs> no chance to get something else. And, and then um, you, you, you just accumulate and you get an average. That's what we get at temperature. Yes? So on the individual shot, it is, we come to this, it is, of course, either this or this. So, uh, yeah, oh, this way. Okay, and then you read the qubits out, but you read not the environment out, okay? Yeah, so you read only the red and the, and the, uh, and the, uh, yeah, the cold and the hot one. Yeah. Um, when you say swap, so is it like a physical position swap between the environment and the space? Exactly. You can do I, either what you want. You can do a position swap or you can do a, um, a gate swap. Okay. So we have the chance to do both. Of course, if you want, if you want to if you swap the physical the qubits, then it is uh, a perfect uh, operation. So it is really the, the well, you cannot do better. The, the, the spin states are hanging on these eyes, and if you swap the eyes, the, the gates, the swap is perfect. The disadvantage, if you want to do a little swap only, kind of fraction of the swap, then you are, then you can do it only via gates, the gates. So we have now done a full swap, but that is really certainly a critique which one can have on this paper that the coupling to the environment is a little bit simple minded thing in our case, and it's not a realistic set. But I'm coming to move on at the end. Yeah. So here we really exchange the qubits. Yeah, it is, it's a, or we don't. Okay. So it is uh, either the environment is not coupled or it is. And then we are taking the whole toolbox of RAM and uh, looking for this passivity circuit. And then we see here is this parameter alpha. And if alpha is one, we have the the Clausius inequality. And if alpha is not one, we have RAM inequalities, okay? These are all second laws of RAM. Okay, here is RAM second laws, wherever we go, and this is a Clausius second law. So uh, kind of a big family of second laws, which you 
Yeah, uh, so coming back to the swap question, what is the fidelity you can achieve in those gates that you implemented? Yes, so coming back to the swap gate. So the swap can be either done, you keep the eyes, you bring them into potential, and then you make a sequence which swaps the quantum information from one to the other. So something like this, okay? But you keep the eyes in place and you do it with a with a laser driven gate detection. That would be a that would be a gate swap. I call it a gate swap. Okay. It is can be decomposed in your synops. Yeah. The other option is you take your spins, which are hanging on the side, and you say, okay, I just move the eye. I just turn the crystal. This is a iron swap. And it works perfectly well because your spins are perfect. You have no gate errors. So here it is beautiful to do it. But this advantage, if you want to do a square of whatever two of a swap on, you want to stop the swap in the middle somehow. Okay. This is of course not possible to switch the iron positions. <laughs> so whatever we like to use, we take the one or the other. Okay. Here we are better off with the physical swap. In other cases, we would not do a physical swap because we just need we need the square root of the swap or, or just a fraction of the swap. So, yeah. So one could replace this heat leak by a little heat leak. Now it's a full heat leak, so to say. We, we could now uh, make the heat leak smaller, smaller, smaller by doing just a, a, a gate swap and do this only a fraction of a gate swap. Then we would make this ch check it for more sensitivity. Okay, but this is now the second law here, and this is the RAM second laws all over the place. And here, this is this region where this is below here, this region here from, from uh, 0 0.509 to zero, we can violate the global passivity inequality. So that is clearly detecting the heat leak more efficiency than the second law, because with the second law, you would not detect it. Of course, we have chosen our temperatures such that we cannot detect it with the second law, but we can detect it with RAM law, okay? So this is end craft, I tell you, frankly. Huh? And here are the probabilities which you find. So there is zero, almost zero at one, one, and there is this, the cold and the hot and the cold and the hot here. So mostly there are zero, zero and so on. And from these probabilities, which we determine out of 8,000 repetitions of the code, will reveal this uh, average value of B to the alpha and plotted versus alpha. And then we see the violation here and over this range. So that is, uh, and we see for this parameter, we would not detect it from the second law, but we do it detect it from the global passivity. And uh, without heat lead, you see these are the probabilities, and then you have no 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 region where you violate. Of course, you have no heat leak, so you have no violation. You you have no heat leak to detect because there is no at the beginning. Yeah. Okay. And now we do the passivity. Deformation, which is an addition to this. And for this, we have to uh, violate this inequality. And the passivity uh, violation, uh, no, the passivity deformation test that is in this range here. So again, we run this algorithm, we look for the probabilities of the qubits which we are allowed to measure, of course, not the environment qubit. And then we check. I have to go through this. With heat leak, we have a region where we detect it. Without heat leak, the red and the and the blue, red and blue, here red and blue, do not coincide. Here red and blue do coincide. Here in this region, the red and the blue follow this inequality. And here, the red is much smaller than the blue, so we don't violate anything here. So that means here we have, with the heat leak, we have seen this heat leak, and if there's no heat leak, of course we don't see heat leak, and we cannot check 
that this passivity deformation is also more sharp as a test as compared with the global passivity test. Because if we take the global passivity with these parameters, then we cannot see the heat leak, but we can see it in the passivity deformation circle. Okay. So there is kind of an order. Second law is kind of the normal one. The next better is passivity, uh, uh, global passivity test, and the best is passivity deformation. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I think the source, the, the main source the heat leak. And it, yes, can you jump back This is kind of, uh, uh, yeah, of course we know the source of the heat leak. That, that is exactly where we, we handcraft the circuits, so to say. That there's the heat leak. If we, we know what is the heat in this heat leak qubit, and we know the coupling. So we know everything here. It is a, just an artificial system. It is not the real one. I'm coming to this later. It's really also your question. Um, because that is, see here in this moment, we just want to verify experimentally that the ideas of drum are feasible, OK? It is not that we are detecting something meaningful, OK? It is a it is a show up circuit, okay, to say it frankly. So now I'm coming to the point, okay. Here, this is the paper which we published, and this was what we also state what we would we want in future. We want in future look for systems coupled to real environments rather this controlled and hidden qubits, which we do now. So so going a little bit beyond what we've done and not really putting the qubit, which is playing the role of the heat leak by hand, and then, okay, well, there is a heat leak qubit, okay? It's, it's not a big surprise, yeah, at that moment, but if you have a real environment, that is much more interesting, I guess. And a, a step towards this is here, also in the group of Norbert Linke, and they had published this week, where they repeated the heat leak test, moreover, such that you accumulate the tests better, okay? So they, they uh, it's periodic, okay? And that, that it was a variation which goes towards this. Okay, maybe we switch gears here and go to the second part, and that is probably the coherent evolution of quantum thermodynamics. And we were stimulated by these two papers. Um, so this is about work fluctuation in slow driven processes, quantum signatures. That's what we are looking for, okay? And um, yeah, um, it, it is the, about the dissipation relation. So you have some non-commuting protocol. That is a commuting protocol. If you have a non-computing protocol where this is unequal zero, we have had the equation on the board. Then there is an additional thing coming up, and that's the quantum contribution of to this uh, fluctuation dissipation uh, relations. So we drive a process at some temperature, and that leads to a certain width of your distribution of your work distribution. So what do you need? You need to drive a process, you need to have it done at a certain temperature, and then you have to have a method to measure your work distribution accurately in the experiment. And that's what they claim. They show theoretically that a slowly driven quantum system violates the conventional, the classical fluctuation dissipation relation whenever quantum appearance is generated along the protocol. And that is when you have a non-commuting protocol. And then they calculate what is this quantum addition to the classical uh, fluctuation dissipation relation. So these are, we, we formed this team here with friends from Trio, Jens Eisard, and of course, Giacomo was super important. I think he was the most important here, and Martin. Uh, and this is the experiment we talked So that is the classical fluctuation dissipation relation. It relates the average work to the variation of this 
uh, uh, already. No, 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 I'm, I'm shocked. <laughs> Just creating uh, more functions. okay. So you you relate the the width of this uh, distribution to the to the size of it, and you want to have a slowly turning system in contact with the double bound. And um, yeah, there's coming up this quantum very uh, the quantum violation to this or the quantum addition. I don't know whether I want to write violation, but there's something quantum on it, and. What is shown in this paper yet that you can run it as a discrete protocol. That is very important for us because you do a unitary rotation of your spin, you thermalize, you do a unitary, you thermalize, and so on. And not doing it all together. That would be very hard because you, you remember we do our spin uh, temperature by optical pumping, and the gates are totally different lasers, and we don't want to mix the debate. So it is this discrete protocol which is important for us. And that is here illustrated in this paper. And then you want to have a clear driving with the non commuting protocol. And F is delta F here. It appears in the equation, but it is zero for all the protocol which we are doing because this is invariant in our Hamilton. Okay, so. It is always that the F is here, but we don't we don't need it. We have just this this part of the formulas. So what do we need for our experiments? We need the tunable Hamiltonian, something where we can rotate a spin. Okay. We need to control the thermalization, and then this is also pretty challenging to look for the work uh, distribution and really looking accurately because we will chop this. Uh, into a discrete protocol with very little steps, okay, very little steps. And, and then experiment errors occur and so on. And it's not so easy to, to have the access with a high accuracy to these work statistics. Okay, that is now the, the, the Hamiltonian which we use. So we are, that's coming back to your question, a cold uh, qubit to start with would point mostly to the bottom, okay? And if the temperature is higher, then it is pointing up more or less. So if it's very cold, it's pointing up completely down to the, to the zero. And then you're driving your qubit with this sigma x and sigma z operators according to this parameter theta. So you're just driving your qubit on the block sphere. That's the whole thing. Okay. Yeah. So we can chop this angle in very small steps. That is the discrete protocol. And alternatives, rotation, rotation and thermalization, and rotation and thermalization, and 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 and. And then at the end we look for the work by a two-point measurement. Okay, that's what we need. To measure whether we put some work or took some work or nothing happened. So this is the protocol with we run. We, we start with zero, we thermalize, then we measure. Let's forget for the moment what we do when we measure. We measure, then we do this rotation, we measure again. That's the two-point measurement. But our measurement is destructive. I explained you how the measurement works. We get a new light from nine that changes everything. We have to reinitialize, we measure the state, we have to reinitialize the qubit from zero, do the rotation according to the measurement outcome, and then continue. So that is how we measure here. That is the measurement. And then we repeat this. You remember the protocol had many steps here. So we repeat this n times. And the, the higher n is. The, the, the smaller are these little rotations of the block vector, the more it is chopped into small pieces with a very high end. And that is a slow driving if we do a very high end. But we have a bam, bam. This is not what we want. It's not under the slow driving. So we want to chop it up in very small yeah. Okay. So that is now how we determine the work. We measure, 
and we get either um, an outcome of one, the spin is up before it was down, that is certainly a plus one, or the spin was zero, uh, was on one, and then it's zero. This is a minus one, or the spin is not changed. So these are the probabilities how the work. And that this is for one step only, but we have many steps, okay? We have to sum up this work from uh, this work over n steps. And then we get the work for one representation. And then we do repeat this for statistics 8,000 times and get word distributions for a certain set of parameters. And then we have from this word distribution, we can determine the width of this word distribution. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so are you interested only in the word distribution after the question has finished? Huh? Or are you interested in the word distribution also after the, like only after the first call has been finished or also in kind of the time of the book? Yeah. Uh, we, we 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 do all the end steps and then we uh well but I mean you have to measure the function. We have also we have well if you want to have we have all, all our work distributions uh, yeah sure but here we are just looking for the width and then we but the data are well yes I just wondered why you need to make the uh we we uh well we have n and steps to do so. Um, I guess we have to do this and this measurement, yes, in order to compare. So this is maybe the spin is up and then it's down. Then we we count as minus one and the work is good. and then. Huh? I guess I, I guess one interpretation would be that um, if you're doing continuous measurements, higher. The evolution is taking yeah, we cannot measure why I think the relocation is always a discrete that has this is given by our architecture. It's not possible to measure why the right. But the, the paper which I showed you shows that it is feasible also to do it in discrete steps. Okay. And now so we determine this width of the work distribution, that's this uh, sigma v, and then we can increase the number of steps to go to the slow diving regime, where the speed is slow. That means this delta H, that's the energy over the number of steps is small against one. So that is made when we chop our, our evolution into many, many steps, then we call it a, a slow drive. Okay. So now, uh, well, this is what we had. Uh, yeah. And for this first result, we look how this quantum part looks when we vary the driving speed. Okay. We vary the driving speed. So we look for this variance of the work as a function of driving speed. We always put low temperature. Here, in this case, we have a beta of zero point uh, of three point four, which means the upper state is almost not populated. Okay, so we are starting here a little bit off, yeah, a little bit off, and then we are taking this in, but but by either by bing 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 or by just tick, 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 tick. okay. So this is varying the n. And then we plot the rescale quantity n times q, n times this quantum addition over this energy. And that's what the y axis is. And what we get is here for a protocol with, with three steps or four, or six or so, or 10 steps, we get this data. These are our data. This is the, the addition to the standard quantum fluctuation uh, to this classical fluctuation theory. So that is off from an incoherent process. How do we simulate these blue curves? We take all the coherences out. Yeah, So there is no coherent protocol here. That means we do not have any, the, the basis still set basis, okay? Yeah. Yeah, but here in this case, 
we are rotating a little bit out of the Z basis. That means the measurement process projects and gets additional noise, additional fluctuations. And what we observe from the experiments is that this goes to a here we are in the slow driving regime where we have many steps. And there we have really a large offset between these data points and, or, and the blue curve, which would correspond to an incoherent process without coherences. And these are 10 standard deviations away from each other. Now there is another thing that's this spam error. If we are doing only a little rotation, and many of them, we have to measure basically always the ground state. And a little bit of bad measurements introduces fluctuations. So the, if you do a lot of measurements and they are just not perfect, then these measurements accumulate in error. All these errors accumulate. And this is called this, uh, the preparation and uh, measurement error, okay? The spin preparation and error. Uh, uh, and, uh, yeah, spend error. Okay, that's preparation and measurement error. And this is accumulating because if you have 10 steps, you make 10 times more errors than, or you make more, 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 much more errors as compared to a few steps. So that is the spam increases with N, the inquiry in protocol decreases with N, but fortunately, there is still this large gap, and we see this quantum part clearly appearing. Okay, the genuine quantum thermodynamic. Sigma is visible. Now we study versus temperature. The correction to the classical fluctuation here. Now we have the slow driving. We have n equals five. We are on the slow driving regime. So n equals five is here. It is clearly already slow driving. So now we keep this n fixed and we vary now the temperature. This is the temperature. Here we have a hot spin to start with, here with a cold spin to start with. This is low temperature. And we see that this quantum correction to the fluctuation, this Q, N times Q, increases when you go to low temperature. Here you have the quantum fluctuations dominating, but here you have the thermal fluctuations dominating. And again, we can see that this quantum fluctuations are clearly significant. Even we have this band error, which is our problem, okay, our experimental problem that makes a lot also of fluctuations, but it is clear that these fluctuations are genuine quantum effects and not coming from spam. They are very far away from this line. Now, our theory friends have some idea how this curve should look like, and this is now the little calculation which they come up that is this quantum contribution, the normalized quantum contribution that has this equation. And if you go and, and make better uh, and, and make an approximation, you see there is this part plus all of beta squared. So that is beta squared. And that is what is kind of explaining at least this part here when, when it comes out of this. Uh, it should be somehow quadratic. Okay. And that's what we observe experimentally. So in total, we have seen this, that there are really quantum additions to the fluctuations. And my, my uh, personal take on this is that we have rotated the basis out of the measurement axis and that leads to fluctuations if you measure now the wrong axis. And that cannot have a poor classical system. And this genuine quantum. Okay. Now we're going on and looking to this work extraction in part three of my talk. Now we are dealing with our Dublin friends here, John and Michael. And uh, yeah, that has been triggered by this work here, where a, a, a daemon, she is here, the daemon, and she could um, enhance the work extraction yeah, by, by taking the feedback protocol and two qubits. And uh, well, that is here again the big right? We show that it is possible to optimize the process, so we need a nice protocol for work extraction, thanks to the correlation between two parts of the system and feedback. Yeah, 
And we are in the lucky situation that we can measure one qubit and measure the outcome. And this takes a millisecond. And then we can decide with the FPGA control electronics what we do later. And this decision takes a few microseconds, really short. And then something is done or not done. Yeah, according. So, of course, this measurement starts on the daemon qubit. She measures her qubit and then she decides whether you want to do something with with the uh, client with the agent unit. So this is what they predict that this work extraction depends on the quantum concurrence. So here's the relative work extraction and that is the quantum concurrence. And if you have a lot of correlation, of course, then you can nicely extract work. Yes, that is not such a big su surprise, but here it comes with a formula which we should remember Delta V over epsilon should be epsilon. Later, it is delta V over epsilon. That comes to concurrence squared over two. And that is this red curve here, which we are now looking for and checking whether we find it if we drive the right and the perfect problem. Okay, so we have uh, only two qubits. We have a client and uh, we have an agent and we have a, a Daemon, okay, and the daemon we can measure, the agent we cannot measure. We have to make some entanglement in order to make the game interesting. And then, as I said, you count the photons for the daemon. You have a FPGA system on chip design, and then it decides real decision logic in a few microseconds and and does something with the with the other qubits, okay. And that's the protocol. Okay, we go now to the protocol. We have the uh, the, the daemon. She is here controlling her lower qubit, and this is uh, our pure client, which is sitting here, and he's just a victim of of the daemon. So it is really a male female game. Uh, he, he, she can do everything, and he has just to suffer. Okay, so first they get the bell state. And this is this block here is expressed in the native gate set. It's single bit operation. It's a ZZ combined ZZ gates, an X rotation, and so on. So this block is is heavily uh, uh, is a lot of sequence of laser pulse. Okay, and then we are going to produce a, a fancy state here. This with the with the uh, conditional rotation here. So that's a parametric gate to generate a state which would resemble Gibbs state if the agent would measure. Okay, so he thinks he is in a thermal state. Okay, and that is the whole gate sequence for this thing here. It generates with a certain rotation angle theta some state which he thinks would be Gibbs. And if this theta is zero, the temperature is infinite. If the theta is pi over two, the temperature is zero. And we are changing this theta, and we can then produce this for any thermal input, so to say. And now comes the next step of the algorithm. That's the daemon's measurement. She is measuring the per qubit. And that is, of course, done in the same way as I showed you before. She measures it, but she scatters light and so on. So she has to reprepare the qubit in zero, and then the measurement outcome is imprinted on her qubit, on her freshly recovered qubit. She prepares again the measured state. That's her measurement altogether. And then comes a conditional swap. Now she can do what she likes. She has some information gain. And now she decides what to do. And I tell you what she should do. The bad state is this one. I just look what is the state here. It's zero of the agent, one of the daemon, plus one of the agent, zero of the daemon. Okay, that is this state. Now comes this y of theta, which is this conditional rotation. And the state which is generated looks quite similar. Let's look for theta equals zero. The, uh, for theta equals uh, zero, the cosine is is one. Yeah, and then we have to recover the bell state. For theta equals 
pi over two, we have uh, here this term, and we just left this one, zero, one, one, zero, zero. So that is the low temperature pivot, so to say, okay? She has, he has got no energy, this is just zero, zero. So the, 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 uh, there is nothing there, okay? So that is what we have now. It looks thermal for the for the agent, and then she does the measurement, and she can measure her qubit either at zero or at one, with equal probability. That happens. Well, we can check why it's, it's equal probability, but sine and cosine of, of a demon is zero, and here's demon zero. So this is the same, and that's one. So that is correct. And now she can say, okay, should I do a swap or not? Should I swap these guys or not? I want to extract energy from the two guys. And then I can now control this swap using my information. Dump this condition swap and gets this qubit swapped over or not. And then finally you check whether it happened or not, what was the final outcome? Did the whole iron work? Is the agent happy or not yeah, with an extraction? And this is now the function of the dragon. Okay, here's the theta. The theta varies between zero and five and zero point five and one half. And this is the temperature. So this is the high temperature limit, that's the low temperature limit. And here we Determine these probabilities. The daemon measured the first time, and then the second time it's called the daemon's measured again, and the agent measured again, where the agent has not been measured before. So, daemon, first time measurement, then making the decision, and then the last measurement are called E dash and A dash. And what does this mean now? The green curve here. The daemon measured zero. And said, okay, I would now better sw uh, swap my qubits. And you see it worked. The demo got on the final measurement one. Cool. I, I've stolen the energy from the client. Okay. And the client is with zero. There's also this curve. The demo is at has got a zero and wants to swap, but doesn't help. Okay. The temperature is too low. There is no, no nothing to steal from the from the other partner. So it stays a zero. And you see now the green curve here. With higher temperature, you can make this process very successful. So that happens in a lot of cases that the daemon can steal this qubit, flip it over. But if the energy is not there, if the temperature is so low, then you are ending that this process is at, at very low temperature. You, you have mostly this process. You want to steal the energy, but there is no energy because the spin temperature is so low, okay? Very simple. Can also happen that the daemon has already got a qubit in one and then no use to, to flip it, okay, to swap it. So that is this curve here. And then there are other curves here, which are fortunately very, very small, you know, and they are due to gate errors or measurement errors. That the daemon thought it was good to swap, but it was just a mismeasurement. It was not a perfect measurement. But as I told you, these bad measurements are typically in the range of uh, 0.5% or less. So they are harmless. But what you see is that the stage lines, this would be the ideal shape for the green, but we see there is a deviation. And this is a fit here, which takes into account a little bit a wrong gate, which we do. So the bell state is not perfect, and this control Y gate is not perfect. And that makes all these deviations, explains them perfectly. So you see with temperature, we see that these different processes happen, and the demon can extract, she can extract energy efficiently with the protocol. And now we want to check this equation and we independently de determine the concurrence of the state that we give them and the energy covariance and prove that this really holds, that this extracted energy, the fractional one, you remember the, form the formula, 
has to do with the C squared. And that is now C squared or two plotted where this is, and this is a line, okay? This should be a line uh, which shows this equation. And we are a little bit off this line, and this is because of gate errors and measurement errors, okay? So this is now the daemon stuff, and I'm coming to the final summary of my talk that we had this coherent work protocol with two point measurements, and we should uh, violate this. Uh, that's the dissipation fluctuation theory. We had this passivity framework checked out, and hopefully in future we can use it really in a quantum computer as a, as a real tool and not only as a Example, and then I showed you this protocol from our Dublin friends, which we implemented, and it works to convert one correlation into classical correlation and then to suck energy out efficiently. Like that is really what it does. And now I'm coming to a little bit my outlook, and that is what we are planning. So far, we have been playing with two ions in the laser interaction zone, and you know that you cannot play piano at least not Beethoven with two figures, okay? That is just not possible. You need two hands. It would be even better if you have 10 fingers on each hand, and then you could play really great. And that's what we do it. So in our addressing zone, there will be 10 lines, each of them in the focus of one laser, so we can play with 10 qubits, all of them all together, quickly without moving the lines around. But this would be only a 10 qubit processor, it's not good enough. But then we do shuttle, we kind of bring ion crystals together with 10 ions, and then we shuttle them into this region. So we are not moving the hands, we are moving the keys underneath the hands. That's the idea. And that will bring us to register of 1500 qubits. We have this thing working together with a classical high performance computer, because typically trapped ion or quantum processors are working together with high performance classical computer, we have this user front end, and I show you quickly how it looks. This is our laser control. This is now really uh, should be a reliable system. And this is our quantum server room in construction. And when you're coming, you are really invited. If you are coming along, these are all the laser racks. And here in the middle, we have space for four of these benches, which are each of them equipped with one quantum processor. And the user does not even uh, has to access or to know what is going on. It is all uh, that you are accessing. We are just we are um, we are the, your your interface, and this is one control room uh, where we are doing this. This is a compiler you send in your code, and then it's executed. That's simple, and that's my outlook. We want to scale up the system at the reservoir. We want to scale up the sequence step. These are, by the way, the new traps we are fabricating in our genomes. Then we can do daemon gains with multiple qubits and multiple in sequence readouts. So we can do repeatedly couple the daemon to something and measure this again. So if you have some fantasies on this, just contact me. Multi ion heat engines are also an interesting topic and multi ID transport, and then finally run your quantum thermodynamics and it's called yourself, okay? And we don't have to deal with it any longer. You just run one. Thank you very much. Yeah, the classical world is a commuting process. Yes. Right. But then, uh, at this field, like, it's something that's not classical, whatever it is, that's the point of characters. This whole thing is going to be the expression. Yeah. Is there any way to derive the independence of the Something. I mean, you did show us this one, the error of the version is on the second year. Yeah, you have, you have to drive a protocol where your measurement axis is always according to your spin orientation. And then if you do this, then, then you would drive a classical control. So say if you would change just the, for the spin, well, you, you would need to 
accommodate with spin orientation somehow in the measurement, and then you would see not, not such additional fluctuations. So, uh, yeah, it's hard to make a classical protocol on a spin, see, because the spin rotates out of this x, y, z axis if you drive this Hamiltonian threshold. And you're just driving it out of this measurement. So one has to conceive a new protocol, or you, you just make an that's what we did. Our theory grants made just the simulation. What happens if you are just taking into account an omega one and omega final, omega initial, omega final, and you're varying only the energy in a certain time? So then it is not a spin which is rotated, but it's just an energy with a change. And also then you can be non-adiabatic or adiabatic if you are very slow. But this is the classical part, okay? When you're just talking about these non-adiabatic or adiabatic parts in, in energy, so to say. And now if you are adding that the spin is rotating out of your measured axis and then you have one projection noise, this is exactly, and this doesn't, it, is it, that is the, the wonderful thing that is really, they were so eager to see these things, okay? That if you go to very slow driving, that was the most important point for them. Uh, where is it? Here. Said they pushed us into this region, really. They said, go for the slow driving because this, that this is an in-green process has all sorts of fluctuations, okay? So we have to go to this and we said, we don't want to go there because then we have to do so many measurements and the outcome is mostly zero okay and all the errors are accumulating so if you if you are in this regime you make so small steps that where is it wait a minute here that you typically measure this guy okay you measure zero you measure the same here and here okay because nothing happened or almost nothing happened and if you measure here the same then there then this, this outcome is completely dominating. And then you have, of course, the problem that you could have some spam errors which are making fluctuations of the sign. So that's why we were not so eager to go here. And they said, you have to trim your machine that you can measure this data. And they are clearly really taking this in process where you're just talking about omega initial, omega final, and vary this over a certain time. This is the blue curve, yeah? And the other one is a screen which is rotated, and then that's the red curve. Yeah, I think this is really important, this, this difference. Yeah. Any other questions? Maybe I ask this, I just noticed. So both theory experiments seem to have this kink in the it's coherent. Problem. Yeah. Is this something? Yeah, that well, well, that these points are below, yeah. I can explain why why they have kind of this oscillation, I'm not sure. Oh, I, 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 I try to explain. Yes, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. This this dip here, yeah, it seems to be some, it has maybe to do the, with the even and the odd type of repetition here. That is what maybe you spin echo something away or whatever. I, I, I'm not exactly sure, but I have to ask also. But that these points are below, that is another problem because typically we drive our Rabi oscillations, yes, in two microseconds. Now we want to do a very tiny rotation only, say a hundredth or a fiftieth of, of a full cycle. That would mean we need to chop this two microseconds into a 50th of two microseconds. That is way too short. So what we do, we reduce the power of driving and do this driving extremely slow that we can still control it. But doing this very slow means it is dangerous because then you're going into an incoherent process. Maybe something is dephasing or the environment is kicking into your eye trap quantum computer, we typically like to have gates which are microseconds, but if you want to chop them into a hundred of, 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 of a gate, then you have to take, make them hundred times longer. And now you're suffering from noise and dissipation a hundred times more. Normally we control this pretty well, but, but now we do artificially our quantum process so slowly, see? 
and this is this is leading to a miscalibration of this these pulses. So it is not a perfect pi over fifty pulse, but maybe it's a pi over fifty, and then a little 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 bit less. Yes, that's the reason for this. Yeah, good question. So, so for the physical swap, we take about 50 to uh, 80 microseconds, and the uh, gate based swap would take also like this, maybe 100 microseconds. A little bit longer, the game breaks. And how do you find out the resources to each other back when it's maybe coupling? So, if you switch the position, and now the environment is also coupled, right? And the position swaps are related to the muscle swaps. Um, yeah. Which position is there? The position, position swap is, is uh, yeah, it is a little cheaper. And I don't know. Position swap is kind of we name it fluids, you can also say. You can not do the position swap and say, now I call this one. One and this one zero, maybe. but we did the real swap, maybe we can. But, um, as I said, this is just a very simple way of coupling the environment. That is the most simple way that you really fully swap information from a client to your system. And that was one comment of the referee. He said that our coupling in the mind is most the most simple one. Couldn't you vary this a little bit and do a special type of coupling to the client and check it out whether you, uh, if you do a, a different type of, now we, we really swap the information completely, but if you do a little bit of a different uh, coupling to the mind, that would be good. That's what he said. So maybe you were directly. But he was right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's plenty of time to ask. Of course, if there are no more questions, join me in thanking Ferdinand, Daniel, and Thank you. Thank you. So one question yeah so when you measure the vacuum and when it measures why do you need to reinitialize that can't you just use the same cube yeah of course it's the same ion but uh it is the same ion of course yeah then but why do you need to reinitialize apply now uh, because because the the measurement itself uh Heats up the iron. We have to cool it again. We have to um, to prepare it as a qubit again. To optically pump it, and so on. so that's what we have in order to get it a qubit again. It's it's an iron there. The iron is still there, but uh, it is not. But uh, it is it is not a uh, um, it's not an ideal met. See. <laughs> Also, if you measure photon, you can say, okay, it's now the detector. I could have measured it in a non deposition fashion, then I could use it again also. But uh, the qubit is used up, but we have still the iron, and we just also equally good. You, you, you measure the state that projected the quantum state into this measured outcome. Yeah, if we believe quantum physics. And then you reinitialize this exactly the state. So is, what, what else can we do? Huh? I think it's perfect. And then the first measurement you're talking about, where you yeah, collapse we, and then you know, back to collapse and you know, yeah, that's that's we do it standard. It's, it's okay. I have no problem with this. So then does it prepare in the same I mean similar initial state that you had before? Well, if you yeah, you say you have a superposition, uh -huh. you measure in in some eigenbasis. Yeah, but you yeah. get an outcome zero or one. You cannot get more than classical information. Exactly. Yeah. And then you reinitialize in exactly this state. Exactly. So that's, that's fair. Kind of what what else? What else? What else? Can you? Yeah. quantum <laughs> physics. That that is. Uh, I I. It looks a little bit odd. Yeah. In the first moment, but it is absolutely fine. I think there is nothing wrong. 
if you if if you measure something, it is projected into the measured eigenbasis, and then it is like this. Okay, yeah. that's in this moment some quantum magic happens, and that's it. Huh? That's it, that's it. Mm -hmm. Once it collapses, so once it collapsed, yeah, yeah. we have a classical outcome, and we can prepare this state exactly accordingly. Right. Oh. Another question in the there's, last, there's no the problem. Third, that's the third that's part for the yeah. daemon stuff. Yeah, the idea is you you would have extracted work if the daemon is more in the upstate, right? That's yes, the the. the the, 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 there's the, the daemon, and if the daemon has a zero, 